Hi, welcome to Peace Matters, a podcast about contemporary conflicts in Europe and the world, and how to solve them. My name is Marila Huscha, I'm researcher at the International Institute for Peace. Today we're talking about security perceptions in Europe, stationing of nuclear weapons in Belarus, the attempted rebellion in Russia, and how can we get out of this escalatory dynamics in the conflict, in the war. I'm joined here today by Yaugeni Preherman, founder and director of Minsk Dialogue Council on Foreign Relations, and Alexandra Dines, senior researcher at Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Regional Office for Cooperation and Peace in Europe. I hope you find this discussion useful. Enjoy! So, our podcast is called Peace Matters, but we're recording it in a, times, in a time of war. There is actually very little peace um, in Europe, and uh, as we can see already for over a year now, the escalation is still going on. Yeah? So, this particular episode, I want to talk to you about um, the reasons for this ongoing escalation, why uh, there is so much you know, trouble, everyone is really devastated by this war, but it's still somehow going on. There is, uh, there is, no one is retreating, yeah? So maybe it has to do also with some fundamental beliefs in different societies. We, we will a little bit cover that. And then maybe we can also speak about the ways out. How can we overcome this uh, escalatory dynamic? And the very last thing is, of course, the recent events that has shaken Russia, that has shaken, have shaken also EU and uh, the world, and we will also discuss them shortly. So, Alexandra, I want to start with you and ask you this um, question about security perceptions in the European Union. Uh, you are leading a um, research project that's been already uh, going on for some years, where you talk uh, or survey different countries and uh, take opinion polls in different EU countries about how they perceive uh, security environment and who are the friends and the enemies of their particular countries, who are the allies, uh, where the threats are coming from. So. What can you, can you say about that right now? And um, one of the conclusions that you have had in the very recent survey of yours, which was taken in 2022, is that the European Union countries uh, have very similar security perceptions, but they very much differ on conclusions and on policy options that are storming out of that. So can you please elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, thank you, Marilia. So um, our service called Security Radar, and as you mentioned, we have been conducting it for several years and can see the differences before and after the war. So this is the comparison I will be making here, focusing on four countries, two of them from Western Europe, Germany and France, and two of them from the East, it's um, Poland and Latvia. So we see a convergence of threat perceptions. Everybody is afraid of Russia, thinks that Russia is a threat to European security and thinks that Russia is to blame for the war against Ukraine. So here we see not only similar perceptions across the four countries, but also convergence if we compare before and after the invasion. We did first uh, the polling in autumn 2021 and then exactly one year later, so almost one year into the war. And we see that Germans and French now recognize much more strongly a threat coming from Putin, a threat coming from Russia, whereas the Poles and the um, Bolts have been quite afraid and quite perceptive of the threat even before the full-scale invasion. Um, the same goes for the perception of the war in Ukraine. However, where the big difference is, is regarding the future of the European security and especially the place of Ukraine in it. If we ask whether Ukraine should be a member of the EU or of NATO, um, people in uh, Germany or France are quite skeptical. The approval of Ukrainian membership in EU and NATO has risen throughout the war, but it's still less than 50%, while in Latvia and Poland, overwhelming majorities of people say yes. Ukraine should be a member of EU and NATO. This will be certainly a crucial point. We're approaching soon the NATO summit in July, and this level of disagreement runs also through the governments. It's not only among the population. One very important similarity I think is worth highlighting is the attitude towards sending weapons. All societies seem to be quite polarized. If we ask people, do you think more weapons should be sent to Ukrainian military? 
small majority <coughs> say yes, but also almost equally as many people say no. But if it's about sending out troops to Ukraine, this question is not being posed yet politically, but we decided to ask people, how do they think about sending own troops to Ukraine? Overwhelming majorities in all countries say clearly no, they oppose such move. So here we see convergence of threat perceptions, convergence of response, and this regards many other questions like how to deal with Russia, increase sanctions, decouple economically from Russia, ban oil and gas, etc. But quite different understanding which role Ukraine will play in the future system. This is the biggest disagreement. Yeah. So I take from that that actually the invasion uh, of uh, Russia into Ukraine in 2022 changed this, uh, you know, uh, different perceptions they, that the European countries had, and they're now much more united on what they are uh, thinking and how they are thinking of approaching uh, the whole European security. But you already mentioned the question of weapons, and there is one ultimate weapon that we're all, I think, uh, afraid of, I would say, and uh, this is, of course, uh, nuclear weapons that, that are also playing role in this conflict. And, Yohani, I want to uh, start with asking you uh, about this. Um, so um, one of the things that um, one of one part of the discussion on the nuclear weapons is that um, some um, threats uh, made by Putin are dismissed very often as a bluff. Uh, shall we take it as a bluff? Shall we take it seriously? Or uh, what role uh, do these weapons play maybe in the overall dynamics of this conflict? Can they be used? Well, I think the short answer would be yes. Uh, the question is, you know, what contingencies out there might lead to a situation. And honestly, I don't really understand this whole discussion about uh, nuclear rhetoric being a bluff. Obviously, no one wants and intends to use nuclear weapons as a matter of sort of realistic option, because everyone considers nuclear weapons since day one, they were created as the weapon of deterrence, with the exclusion of that short episode when the Americans bombed Japan. But of course, everyone for six, seven uh, decades wanted to leave that in the past and never get back to that, looking at nuclear weapons as the matter of ultimate deterrence. But the problem is that when during a conventional war, which is also accompanied by other dimensions of war in the economic realm, in the information realm, this whole narrative about nuclear weapons as a bluff is becoming so much proliferated, I think it only doubles down on how dangerous it is. Because if ultimately a country like Russia is cornered, and especially against the background of very fundamental problems as we now see, which exist out there in the Russian society and government. So it's not already too difficult to imagine pathways to a situation where they might really decide to use what is called tactical nuclear weapon and I think that's a real danger and I think you know the sooner we understand this across countries and continents if you will uh, the better for all of us because if anything nuclear weapon I mean I'm saying a banal thing cannot be a resolution to anything it can only be an end to many things that we as humanity have been used to uh, again it sounds pathetic but it's I think an obvious truth so if we really want to get out of a situation realistically, not like wishfully, in terms of wishful thinking, then we need to give up this whole idea about, you know, how much of uh, a bluff it is and look seriously for solutions, which unfortunately cannot be found just on the battlefield. They have to be accompanied, in my view, with uh, other developments, including with how the sort of uh, security architecture, maybe architecture is a strong word for now to be used, but security arrangements in Europe could work so that at least to ensure that with all the escalation, which unfortunately is very difficult to stop now, but at least we could get a degree of transparency which will allow to minimize and control risks. Um, Russia is planning to uh, station their tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus already this July. Is it another step in the direction of uh, getting closer to using them, or what, what's the rationale behind this action? Well, theoretically speaking, it is, because always when we th talk theoretically about nuclear deterrence, we imagine sort of a ladder which leads to the most horrible ultimate decision to use 
the nuclear weapon. And on that ladder, you find different stages. One of them is, for instance, declaring openly that you're preparing your nuclear capabilities for usage. Another one is to demonstrate that it is, for example, being transferred to a different country, like in the case of Belarus and Russia. So theoretically and technically speaking, we are getting closer to that most horrible moment. And in fact, it does reflect the overall logic of an escalation, which in my view is primarily driven by what we sort of in the academic community call structural factors. In other words, it's not just only the perceptions and decisions, preferences of political leaders, of course, there is an important place for those perceptions and decisions, but then they are made in the context of something which exists out there as an objective factor, and that is called a structural evolution of a conflict. So structurally, when this is happening, what is sort of at play out there is also called a security dilemma. The problem with the security dilemma is that when countries stop talking to one another properly and when they only think about the uh, malign intentions on the other side, everything turns not just black and white, but purely black. Whatever the other side does, and it does it something in the military realm, for example, to ensure for its own security in a defensive way, is inevitably read, interpreted by the other side as a potentially dangerous, threatening development. And this is the spiral which leads us to the most, unfortunately, horrible scenarios. And the nuclear weapon is out there as sort of the key indicator of that development. Alexandra, do um, the countries that you surveyed or other European countries, do they see the spiral in the same way? Is there also the same understanding that we are now in this dynamic where every action is interpreted as black and white? Yes, thank you. Uh, I share Yevgeny's concern and the data indeed shows that. I think that the nuclear saber rattling and the actual danger from nuclear escalation should by no way be underestimated. And European citizens, according to, to our survey, indeed share this concern in three of the four countries. Way over three quarters of the Soviet people are afraid of a nuclear escalation. Only in Germany it's 55% who say so, mm -hmm. which is a surprisingly, surprisingly low yeah. figure. There may be different explanations to that. Maybe the survey was done at the time when, particularly in Germany, there was this talk in the media of the potential nuclear bluff. We still could say it's an absolute majority, but this quite significant difference between 55 and 75% in Europe's, uh, in Germany's neighboring countries is quite surprising. But I would overall say, yes, people are afraid. Um, I think what people also tend to forget or what we don't hear that much in the discourse that Russia has a very big escalation potential below the nuclear escalation, mm -hmm. which is absolutely the worst case scenario. I completely agree with Yahini, but there are many conventional ways to afflict a lot of pain and destruction on, on Ukraine or to intimidate neighbors. And there are also, unfortunately, other very destructive weapons that Russia might uh, might think of using. I have another thought in terms of uh, stationing of, of rockets, of nuclear capable rockets in, in Belarus, what might be maybe an idea for European decision makers to threaten Russia or to convey to Russia that if those missiles were launched, Russia would receive a response and Russia will be to blame because Lukashenko said quite clearly and publicly that he would not press the button if he didn't receive an okay from Putin. And I think this could be one way of perhaps deterring Belarus from actually contemplating even using these weapons to say that the blame would be put on, on Russia. This leads me uh, to maybe to uh, ask you an additional question. How much leeway does he have, does Lukashenko have in this whole discussion of whether he's, uh, how much uh, authority does he have to say that he's uh, going to decide when to press the button, right? And uh, also it concerns many other things. Belarus is uh, supporting Russia in the war, but it's uh, allegedly is doing it against its own will. Um, what does it say about leeway of the authorities? What does it say about the foreign policy of the country? Well, generally speaking, I think there's been a huge mix, an unhelpful mix, and sometimes confusion of 
two different concepts when it comes to Belarus and its leeway in international relations at, the, at this time. The first one is the concept of sovereignty or agency, and the other one is something we can call room for maneuver. So I think a lot of commentators and diplomats have confused the two, and basically they've taken the room for maneuver, which has shrunk in the Belarusian case very dramatically compared, for example, to what it used to be prior to 2020. So they've taken this development for uh, the sover sovereignty erosion. It's obvious that when you have consistently your room for maneuver being shrunk, then ultimately it might lead to the loss of sovereignty. And this is a big, longer term concern for Belarus and for the future of Belarusian sovereignty. But it doesn't help to, let's say it's very simply, jump into this conclusion prematurely without really looking at the facts on the ground. I think everyone would benefit from all those commentators and diplomats being a little bit more attentive, being sort of better researchers when it comes to Belarus, trying to understand what, what, what kind of the options are out there. I, I think the recent developments when Lukashenko basically mediated this deal between Prigozhin and uh, the Russian government of Putin, it does show that he has some agency, Minsk has some agency, and as, as sort of soon as uh, they see their own interests and there is enough room for maneuver, they are ready, they have political will and ability to use that room for maneuver. So ultimately the question is not whether Minsk has already lost sovereignty. I think the, the answer is clearly no. The answer is if we really want Minsk to preserve sovereignty and expand it, room for maneuver, then let's do that. Let's find ways of doing that, perhaps without, you know, uh, exercising certain things which are unacceptable for the West. But that's the right question to be asked. Then when it comes to the nuclear uh, factor, it's also interesting. First of all, this question about who is going to decide on the use of nuclear weapons has no answer at this point, because any answer other than this is kept in the Russian hands is going to violate the NPT Treaty, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which clearly says that it's going to be a violation of the treaty of the country which possesses nuclear weapons, hands it over, any kind of control of the nuclear weapon to a different country, and the country which is non-nuclear accepts that. So technically the only, re the only answer you can get is that, the one that Russians are given right now. At the same time, even from a tactical standpoint, neither Minsk nor Moscow are interested in giving a clear answer because this is part of the ambiguity, and ambiguity is also supposed to be as a deterrent here. But I think, very importantly, something which has been missing from this discussion about nuclear uh, tactical uh, missiles and uh, uh, weapons being deployed at Belarus, everyone talks about why Russia wants it. But very few people do talk about why Belarus wanted it. And Lukashenko was very vocal, proactively vocal about this weapon. Why is it important to ask this question? In my view, because it can help us to understand what ways of de-escalation are still there. Minsk wanted this weapon because it really perceived the situation around it, primarily you know, Ukraine and NATO, exactly the same way as certain NATO member states in Europe perceived their own security situations at the beginning of the 1950s, when the conventional capabilities on the NATO side were much lower compared to what the Soviet Union and its allies had. So back then they decided that nuclear factor was the ultimate deterrence. And that's why they wanted to go for it, not only the Americans, but only uh, seven at that point and now five European states which still host uh, American nukes on the European soil. Exactly the same is playing out now. Minsk understands that if a conventional conflict were to come to its borders, conventionally it's much inferior compared to the potential of NATO. And I don't think that the government in Minsk are fearful of a direct uh, confrontation, direct attack by NATO, but what they fear is a more complicated scenario. We hear a lot of Belarusian fighters that are fighting on Ukraine's side now, that they want to finish their business in Ukraine and then come with weapons to Belarus. And then there were a couple of additional comments from all sorts of politicians or former politicians in the West. For instance, a few weeks ago, the former commander of the ground, ground troops of Poland said that if those fighters come from Ukraine to Belarus, Poland should help them. Anyone in Warsaw will tell you, don't take it seriously. But security are issues which have to be taken seriously. And that's why if you look at this rhetoric and all these developments, the buildup of the conventional capabilities on the Polish side, exactly on the border with Belarus. So if you look at this through the lenses of the Belarusian government, you need to be worried. And that's why they thought that it would be better to host Russian nukes 
even though it also brings about additional risks. Yeah, so I'm, I wanted to additionally uh, ask you about that. So you have this perception inside Belarus uh, from the authorities mm -hmm. that they actually the threat is coming from the West and that's why we need the nukes, that's why we need all other stuff to protect us from that. But then, for example, Belarusian opposition in exile, which is also, um, I would say, which uh, who is maybe an actor that uh, the Europeans are perceiving Belarus through, um, and Svetlana Tikhanovska is talking to different leaders in all the countries and their uh, argument is that uh, actually the threat to Belarus is coming from Russia because Russia is uh, exactly, uh, you know, eroding Belarusian sovereignty. also referred to this discussion already saying that it's not entirely so. So um, what, what to do about that? <laughs> it's a very... Well, I, I think it's very yeah. simple. Uh, you cannot help Belarus to stay sovereign when you a sanction it like crazy when you basically semi-isolate it, introduce a semi-blockade, and when Russia is the only game in town. So it's exactly you know the opposite direction they are pushing Belarus to. I have no idea why certain people, including the Belarusian opposition in exile, are arguing for that. I think it's, it should be clear to everyone that the outcome will be less sovereignty for Belarus than more sovereignty. But I think it's high time that people in the West who are really interested in preserving Belarus as a sovereign state, not because of us Belarusians, but because of the positive factor it can play for regional security. So they just need to be fair with the facts. I think the facts are so clear that there is not much room for interpretation here. Yeah. Go I ahead, have Alexandra. a slightly <laughs> different interpretation, and maybe for the sake of discussion, it's interesting to try to juxtapose it. Uh, we were speaking of room for maneuver, which I think is an interesting concept, and thanks for pointing out the difference between sovereignty and room for maneuver. I absolutely agree with you. I think having seen the events of the weekend, how Lukashenko, it seems, mediated a deal, uh, like you just mentioned, uh, with Prigozhin basically preventing a mutiny that he started on the same day, 24th of June, from you know, reaching Moscow and potentially toppling the Russian government. From basic of it, we don't exactly know as of today what happened. So mm. this is room of interpretation for us three. But what I think is that Lukashenko in this particular situation most likely confirmed that he does not have much leeway or room for maneuver because most likely, again, in my interpretation, it was a deal carved out between the Russian authorities, be it Putin, be it um, people from a Ministry of Defense or certain figures of the Siloviki, and Prigozhin that was publicly presented or kind of played via a close ally or someone who was at this particular moment useful and available to the Russian regime or dependent on the Russian regime, who is the president of Belarus, to present it kind of as a face-saving option for what I perceive as face-saving for both sides. Putin managed to stay out of the whole deal. We remember that addressing the nation in an unusually harsh way, saying there is a mutiny, there are traitors, they need to be prosecuted, basically saying there's no way out of the stalemate. But he did not name Prigozhin personally. He did not name his name, and I think there was good reason for that. This is a potential exit option and potential option that was ultimately taken. And then there's an outside actor with a completely different legitimacy and completely different base who portrays himself or is being asked to play the role of someone who mediates and solves the conflict and allows A, to defuse the situation, so ultimately the rebellion was forestalled and kind of takes care of this a dangerous person, in this case Prigozhin, who was aiming at the Russian leadership. We don't know whether Prigozhin reached Minsk yet, whether he will be actually staying in Belarus, but that's what the deal appears to be as of now. He is out of the play, out of the game, out of Russia. So at least I think it is worth thinking or presuming that this is another possible interpretation that maybe Lukashenko did not show his own initiative and bring himself into play and is now the savior of Russia, celebrated by parts of the world, but rather an agent of a much stronger partner who has a big control over what he can and cannot do and provided Putin a favor, basically. 
So basically, we're now are uh, having a discussion about different interpretations of Lukashenko's agency, right? Uh, was, it, was it his own initiative, right? Was it uh, something that he was told to do? Um, I think uh, I also um, see this discussion concerning the nuclear weapons. Did he really ask Putin to give him nuclear weapons, or was it also like you know ordered to him and he just pretended to want them, right? So, um, but but let me maybe ask you both also about this overall uh, the impact of this weekend's events on Russia itself, right? So just to you know recall, Prigozhin actually is Putin's man. He is a person who. Um, who is heading this uh, private army, who was actually established also uh, through Putin or with his consent, right? Uh, he fought in Syria, he fought in Africa. Um, it's a serious blow if someone like this actually goes against you and very publicly. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Here we are all uh, hearing the news about uh, how Russia is weakened, right? So what, what does it tell us about uh, Russia, about its weakness, for how long is it going to take? Are we going to witness more of the same? Lots of questions. Your takes on that, Yohenny. Exactly for this reason that you explained how painful it has been for Putin personally and for the entire political top brass of Russia, I find it really hard to buy this argument, uh, which Alexander mentioned as a possible interpretation, and now I see more and more of this emerging in the press that you know the Russians agreed between themselves and they just needed Lukashenko as a face-saving mechanism. I mean, you don't make a harsh statement as the leader of Russia in the morning saying you are going to basically eliminate everyone who was part of that to then in the evening uh, come at a situation when you ask Lukashenko to do something like this, you know, and in the end you have Putin so weakened after all this uh, situation that, you know, it's it's not much different from Prigozhin's uh, position right now. But it doesn't, of course, mean that uh, this is going to stay as it is. So what is clear, we, we still don't know a lot of things, once again, and I agree with uh, Alexander, and we, we need to be honest with our audience that we still need to learn uh, many more details before we can be uh, conclusive enough. But what is clear to me is that this is not just an individual case of Prigozhin or uh, Wagner Group, not just something which happened unexpectedly. There was an unexpected element to this, of course, but I think it does reflect some fundamental problems which exist out there in Russian society and in the Russian government system. And if they do not address, if they do not find a way to address it effectively in the weeks, months, maybe years to come, I think Russia is unfortunately set to have some serious tragic developments. And the problem with tragic developments in Russia throughout history have been then the impact. Spillover. Yeah, spillover impacts mm -hmm. a, a great part of the world. So we really need to be really ser uh, serious about the, the situation and I don't also understand a bit of euphoria which is out there in Russia now where a lot of people are simply making jokes out of what happens. I think jokes are good to stabilize yourself psychologically but then a lot of work and a lot of hard thinking is out there. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what, what happens. We now see the domestic dimension which is so problematic in Russia, we now see the war. We also see that the international system is being transformed, which only aggravates uh, the whole problem for Russia. I think these events that we have witnessed on the weekend are in many ways the beginning of the end. And we don't know exactly when the end will be, but the end of this political system that Russia has and that started this war and that doesn't seem to be particularly successful in its war from the perspective of the goals that the regime initially set. Uh, from this perspective, I tend to think or to agree with the thesis that the system showed its weakness when one of the closest allies basically rebels against the system. Of course, in hindsight, one could think it's quite an unusual thing for a sovereign state to allow for years an alternative center of power with weapons to flourish, you know, pretty much without any checks and balances. And we have seen how in the battle for Bakhmut, where basically Russian regular forces were still understaffed, had not enough material, etc., they were reliant on a private military contract to Wagner Group, headed by Prigozhin, to continue mm -hmm. fighting while in the meantime they try to rebuild the regular armed forces to mobilize people, etc. And the moment they 
So they, the regime, the regular forces, did not need Wagner anymore. They kind of tried to get rid of him and saw the consequences of challenging an alternative source of power that they themselves once created. So in this sense, certainly, the world has seen that there are cracks in the system, that Putin is not as strong and the vertical of power is not as solid as we might have thought. At the same time, one could draw a different conclusion that I think coexists with this first one about the weakness. The system is quite resilient. Putin has shown itself, himself, with the help of his closest ally Lukashenko, that he can, you know, as a chameleon, play events in the course of just 24 hours from a catastrophic brink, again towards his own benefit. His uh, public appearance just today was on some you know, industrialist meeting congratulating some people. So something completely civilian, completely war unrelated. He sends a message out there, business as usual, nothing has happened. I think over the past 20 years that Putin has been in power, even longer, he has demonstrated time and again his mastery of the situation and ability, as the Russian saying goes, to come out of the water dry. He's maybe a little bit wet on some pieces of his clothing, but I guess there is a certain resilience he has demonstrated yet again. However, back to my initial <laughs> saying that it's the beginning of the end, I believe many people inside Russia watched what happened with big concern. Soldiers have been watching the videos mm -hmm. of Prigozhin sitting in the trenches, and at least one thing that Prigozhin did in the course of these 24 hours that I think will have a larger impact even on how the war will unfold and how the situation in Russia will unfold is that he called a spade a spade. He questioned the legitimacy of the uh, invasion of Ukraine. He was very emotional saying how useless the deaths of Russian soldiers are in this war and he questioned the very basic narrative the Russian regime has been putting forward for months since it started the invasion, that Ukraine and NATO were going to invade Russia and it's actually a war of you know, preventing the enemies from conquering Russia. He said in a very emotional and long and widely watched video that was taken notice of in Russia that this is not true and the president is lying. And I think this will have, in one way or another, we do not know yet, this will have an impact on certain actors that might have not yet stepped onto the forefront in Russia. They may be in the military, they may be in the civil society, they may be who knows where, inside the elites maybe, who have drawn their conclusions. This kind of mutiny is possible and Prigozhin might not have been successful, but maybe someone else will. So I think in the long term, medium and long term, this will have dramatic consequences for the Russian regime and certainly undermined its stability and the goals in the war against Ukraine. So from this discussion I'm taking that uh, there is a lot of uh, shaking ground everywhere in Russia, in Belarus, uh, nuclear in weapons, world. so it is yeah. exactly in the world. There were earthquakes also all over the place. So um, how do we get out of this uh, spiral? What do we do with that? Can you, I know it's a very big question to ask f by the end of this uh, podcast, but maybe mm, name a couple of things. What needs to be done? Who needs to do what? And where are you heading? Well, I refer to this uh, security dilemma concept. I know that when we talk in more broader uh, terms, especially not during any academic discussion, sometimes people think, oh, just drop your academic language and tell us something which makes sense for everyone. But I think this is exactly the moment where we can draw a little bit of wisdom from uh, academia and theory. So if we understand how the security dilemma works, and I said it's an action-reaction dynamic which leads to spiraling tensions, then I think it also points to a possible solution how to tame the dilemma. And the answer is, on the one hand, very simple. On the other hand, it's really difficult to imagine that we can quickly have enough political will across the board, like in different countries, to take it further. So what is needed? The only way to tame the security dilemma is to understand that either we start talking seriously to one another about the dangers we are facing. We don't need to agree. 
but the ultimate goal of talking is to make sure that we minimize the, the risk perception on the other side. We minimize this perception that the other side is all the time up to something bad, to something malign. So that's simply the goal. The others need to understand that this is transparent. Yes, I have an additional missile out there, but look, this is why I'm doing this and come check it. It still might, sh might be shot at you at some point, but just come and touch it. I'm simplifying things, of course. But this is the only way. It can only be resolved in a cooperative way. Some people think, okay, let's just uh, erect this iron curtain mm -hmm. and we'll be back to the golden times of the Cold War. Because for some reason, a lot of people think of the Cold War as something beautiful, something stable. It turned out to be pretty stable compared to some other periods, but it had nothing to do with the iron curtain. It had to do with the fact that the international system got stabilized. It uh, was clear where the Poles were. I mean, the Poles, not the Polish people, but the Poles of the <laughs> international system, the bipolar system. So it was stabilized, and that's why it did not get out of control, even th though there were a lot of opportunities for it. Just remember the, uh, the crisis th yeah, the, <laughs> that were out there. So Iron Curtain is not an answer, because even uh, over the Iron Curtain, you can still have missiles flying. As I said, the only way is to find a cooperative way to at least agree that we don't want uh, a nuclear annihilation of the world. And then from that point, we potentially can take it further in a controlled way somewhere, maybe not to a beautiful world we all want to have or the one we had before, like Europe, free from Lisbon to Vladivostok, and I know Alexander and her colleagues did a lot of wonderful work on that. I, I, I'm afraid we are a little bit uh, further and further away f from that, but at least let's make sure that we pre prevent the worst from happening and the security dilemma helps us to do that. We need to talk and we need to agree on the basics. So talking and communication, this is what Yevgeny suggests. It sounds banal and, you know, simple, but it's the only answer. Yeah. Alexandra, what's your take? I have a threefold vision. Short term, support Ukraine as much as possible now because the developments we have been talking about might have destabilized Russia even if not strongly to the degree that Ukraine can achieve small as it may be but a shift of momentum on the battleground. I hate to say that but right now and throughout the war so far it seems that there was no much space for diplomacy and I take the argument of military experts that only when the situation on the battleground shifts from a current stalemate we have been witnessing for quite a long time, the chances higher two sides will be actually willing to sit and talk. So I hope that these events now maybe will propel the shifting of momentum so that Russia and Ukraine are willing to sit together and talk and there will be hopefully at least a cessation of hostilities or some kind of ceasefire agreement. Second, medium term, I think within the EU, and we have been speaking about those differences in opinion between the publics, we need to be aware of cracks that may be appearing, especially regarding the longer term vision. Ukraine's membership in EU and NATO, this is a very important question. Right now there are recovery conferences being held, the official one in London last week, but also multiple academic conferences, even this very day in this very city. So there is a danger of a very big disappointment and backlash in the Ukrainian society if there will be no coherent vision of how Ukraine can be member of this Western future alliance, be it EU, be it NATO, be it maybe outside these institutions, but somehow in, in the framework, in the system. And here we know that they're underneath the unity that seems to you know, bring us all together in the European Union there are serious differences in opinion and they may put European overall security architecture at risk if they're not addressed. And in the long term, I very much agree with Yohini that we need to keep in mind this vision of cooperative security. In the long term, we need to coexist. Of course, in this place, European security architecture, there should be place for Russia, for Belarus. We hope they will be ruled by maybe more democratic leaders than currently, but in any case we cannot have an influence on that and we need to come to terms with these countries through confidence building measures, mm -hmm. through deconflicting, through management of the current tensions, through revival of arms control agreements, 
through some kind of economic agenda because sanctions cannot be there forever if we assume that fighting in Ukraine stops at a certain point. And here the role of the OSC, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, where all of these countries are member, will be key. Key for restarting talks on peaceful coexistence cooperation in Europe. I think this will be very important in the long term. Thank you very much. Lots of tips, lots of recommendations. I will make sure that they're all heard by the decision makers and implemented. Thank you for your time and it was great to, to listen to this discussion and thank you for watching us and tuning in and I hope you will stay with us and subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Bye-bye.